I'm Richard Piaz, a judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, and I want to thank all of you for answering the notice you received for federal jury service. While not all of you will be selected, your presence here today makes it possible for the court to select a jury from a representative sample of our community. If it wasn't for people like you, we would not be able to make real the Constitution's guarantee of the right to trial by jury. This right is included in our Bill of Rights and guaranteed by the Sixth and Seventh Amendments to the United States Constitution. It applies to all criminal trials and many civil cases. When we first got our Constitution and started having jury trials, only white males, men who owned property, could serve as jurors. And as recently as the early 1970s, only six or seven years before I became a Supreme Court Justice, there were still states in the United States that excused a woman from jury service anytime she did not want to serve. But by including a large spectrum of the community in the jury pool, today we're assured of a broad perspective in the jury box. We want a full sampling of the community because these are the people to whom we entrust our lives, our honor, and our most important issues. When I got my jury summons in the mail, I sort of rolled my eyes and thought, oh, they're still coming after me. Um, I had been a stay-at-home mom for a number of years with young kids, and I had deferred several times. But my kids are really old enough now, and um, I realized this was probably a good time for me to serve. When I first got the jury summons in the mail, I was very nervous. I thought about shredding it and acting like I never got it. Didn't do that, responded to the questionnaire, and got selected. I can understand how someone who gets a notice to come down to court and see if they're needed to serve as a juror might say or think, gee, I don't want to be bothered. What if they don't pick me? I'll have gone down there for nothing. But I think most of us realize that you might be yourself in court someday. You might need to have issues addressed by a jury drawn from your own community. Come to order. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Susan Ilston, and I'm the judge who will be presiding over the trial, which will take place in this courtroom over the next few days. Welcome. Thank you for being here. We couldn't function in our system without the assistance of people like yourself. So first, let me tell you what will happen over the next period of time in this courtroom. Uh, first, I will have some questions to ask all of you. Um, after that, then the lawyers will have an opportunity to ask you a few questions, too. Uh, before I ask you any questions, though, I want to find out about your availability. And when I'm asking you about that, one thing you should bear in mind is that after you have heard the entire case, then you'll have a chance to go back in the jury room and deliberate. So the first series of questions I want to ask you is whether there are any of you uh, for whom sitting on this case for the length of time that we've estimated would be a genuine hardship. And I don't mean a, an inconvenience because it will be inconvenient to all of you. But if there is any of you who, for whom sitting would be so inconvenient and difficult that you feel you just really wouldn't be able to pay attention to the case and give the parties the fair trial they're entitled to, um, anybody who feels that way, please raise your hand and let me know. Uh, all right. Uh, yes, sir. I am Mr. Little. And my wife broke her ankle two weeks ago, and I'm taking care of her. I have to be around to take her to the bathroom and other things around the house. She cannot put any weight on her ankle. And right now, it's very difficult, as we have no other help. And I have to be there. So I don't think I can take that much time off. Uh, do you have a, a job, sir, outside the home? No, I'm retired. All right, thank you. Um, yes, ma'am. What's your name? Ms. Green? Yes, ma'am, Ms. Green. Your Honor, my husband owns a business, and I'm the sole employee. Um, if I were to be out of the office for that length of time, there's no one to replace me. What kind of a business is it? He sells computer equipment, and I'm the one who handles all the bookkeeping, answering phones, sending out correspondence, really anything having to do with the office. Thank you. 
All right, ladies and gentlemen, at this point, uh, I have a set of questions, and I'm going to require each of you to answer these questions out loud and in front of each other. But do not fear, you will know the answer to the questions. If you have a spouse or a partner, what does that person do? Do you have children? What are your hobbies? Have you been in the military? Have you served on a jury before? Questions like that. I'm a self-employed carpenter. I'm a member of the Horseman's Association. My hobbies are golf and horses. Um, I'm single because my wife is deceased and I have a nine-year-old son. I've never been on a jury and never been in the military. Can you think of any reason, sir, that you can't be a fair and impartial juror in this case? No. I'm a legal secretary. I have a son and daughter. I'm divorced, and I was a juror twice on other cases. Those two jury trials that you sat on, um, can you remember if they were criminal or civil trials? Criminal. All right. Now, please don't tell me what happened, but did each of those trials reach verdicts? Yeah. Is there anything about either of those jury experiences that would make it hard for you to be a fair juror in this case, do you think? Just that it's hard to make decisions about other people's lives. Well, that's the hard part. But is there anything specific about this case that would make it hard for you to sit, do you think? No. As I told you before, uh, it's really important that juries decide the case just based on the evidence that's received in the, in the trial. That means that you can't read newspapers about the case, you can't watch television, you can't uh, listen to the radio, or do any research of that sort about the case. That also means that you can't talk to people about the case, which also means you can't talk to your family. When you go home, your family will be curious to know what you're doing. You may tell them you're on a jury. Beyond that, however, you may not discuss the case with them, and you may not let them discuss the case with you. Is there anybody who could not follow the court's rule that you may not discuss this case with anyone else until the case is over? Yes, sir. I'm used to discussing my day with my wife, and I don't know how easy it will be to not discuss the case. Well, it may not be easy. In fact, it's going to be difficult for everyone to uh, impose this sort of cone of silence on yourself during the time that the trial's in session. But if the court orders you not to talk with your wife or anyone else about the case until it's over, do you think if you're selected for this jury, you could follow the court's order in that respect? I can do my best. And do you understand, sir, that if you break your promise in that regard, then these other people here won't be able to do their job and the jury won't be able to do its work? Well, my daughters, they wanted to know. They, they were like, they're teenagers, they're 17 and 18, and they were like, Mom, what is the case about? Well, I'm sorry, girls, I can't talk about it. They're like, ah, come on, Mom. I said, nope, no can do. You know, I followed the judge's directions, and I found it easier as the days went by to actually not say anything, especially until after the case was over. All right, ladies and gentlemen, not only do you have to promise me that you won't discuss this matter at home with your family, you also can't communicate about the case in any way with anyone on any sort of device. This means that you can't uh, go on the Internet, you can't go on chat rooms, you can't go on bulletin boards, it means you can't go on Facebook, you can't go on Google, you can't communicate with any of these wonderful social networking methods that we have these days, or even any that they should invent between now and the end of the trial. You simply may not communicate either to or from anybody about the case until it is over. Uh, is there anyone who can't promise the court that you will avoid doing that during the course of this trial? After sitting and listening to the instructions not to listen or read any you know media information, I feel like that was a great idea because everybody is on the same page. No juror has something in their mind because they heard something else. Um, we all start at the same page, so we all end in a conclusion on the same page. Uh, in addition, until the case is submitted to you at the end of the case for deliberations, it's important that you not talk to each other about the case. Um, you'll have opportunities to be all together in the jury room uh, but it's important that you not discuss the case uh, until it's over. The reason for this is sometimes as we talk about things, we begin to make up our minds about the things that we discuss. And you are not to make up your minds until you have heard all the evidence in the case. So it's important that you not discuss the matter with your fellow jurors until uh, the case is submitted to you for deliberation. At this point, ladies and gentlemen, the attorneys have a chance to ask you a few questions and you must answer their questions as truthfully as you have answered my questions. 
At this point, it's the opportunity of the plaintiff to go first because the plaintiff has the burden of proof in this case. All right, Mr. Brown, you may proceed. As the judge said, we appreciate you being here, and I just have a few questions. First of all, if anyone in the jury box has ever been a party to a lawsuit, could you raise your hand? For more than 200 years, our system of justice has depended on the common sense and sound judgment of citizens, with no stake in the cases they are called upon to decide, other than to render a fair and just decision in light of the governing law. As jurors, your decisions will be important, may be affecting the defendant's liberty, or millions of dollars. But whatever the issue, remember that each and every decision matters a great deal to the people involved in the case. What we ask of you is to bring your sound judgment and an open mind into the courtroom so that you and your fellow jurors will be able to render a fair and impartial verdict should you be chosen. It is the court's goal in every jury trial to find jurors who will decide the case before them without prejudice or bias because under our Constitution, everyone deserves a fair trial. So today I'd like to talk to you about what exactly bias is and why we should all keep improper biases out of the courtroom. Biases are prejudices in favor or against a thing, person, or group compared with another. Basically, bias equals prejudging in a positive way or a negative way. It's been proven that most biases happen at an unconscious level. In fact, researchers have found that unconscious bias is a part of how we all think and process information. The shortcuts our minds rely on can be really helpful in our day-to-day -day lives because they allow us to make good and efficient decisions based on past experience. But some of the shortcuts that we use, the ones that are driven by unconscious bias, can have really negative consequences, causing us to unknowingly make unfair distinctions among individuals when everyone should be judged fairly. For example, although many people in the U.S. believe it's wrong to judge people by stereotypes based on things like age, race, or gender, Studies have shown that we often react unconsciously to these differences to make decisions in our day-to-day -day lives. And yet we are not always aware when it's happening. Earlier in this video, we all saw the judge. Truth is, each of us made instantaneous decisions or prejudgments about what type of person he is, even though we don't know him or have any additional information about him. Perhaps you instinctively felt that he was smart, impartial, patient, open-minded, or in charge. Or you may have concluded that he was all-powerful, tough, or scary. And when you first view this biker, you may instinctively feel he is either an adventurous free spirit or maybe a rebel who's tough, abrasive, or even dangerous. Through unconscious bias, our minds make quick decisions we are not aware of so that we can feel comfortable, safe, and confident. In one study, science faculty at research institutions looking to hire a science laboratory manager reviewed the same resume with some copies randomly assigned a man's name and others a woman's name. It turns out that male and female evaluators were more likely to conclude that the male candidate was more competent and more worthy of being hired than the female candidate, even though the resumes were exactly the same. The assumptions underlying these results, that men as a group are better at science, can lead to flawed assessments of individuals. In this example, unconscious bias influenced what the resume evaluators did without them even realizing it. Considering all the information instead of making a decision based on the information that comes to mind most quickly can help us avoid relying only on our preconceptions. When you are aware that pretty much everyone has unconscious bias stereotypes and attitudes based on things like age, race, and gender, you can look for those biases and have a better chance of preventing unconscious bias from affecting your decisions and judgments as a juror. 
In fact, jurors have told us that once they were made aware of unconscious bias, they were able to check in with themselves during the trial and evaluate their decision-making process. What studies have shown does work is to first know that unconscious bias exists and occurs for all of us. Second, carefully examine our decisions and judgments as jurors. And third, question our decisions by asking whether they would be different if the witness, lawyer, or person on trial were of a different race, age, or gender. Don't hesitate to ask yourself about unconscious bias. And at the end of the trial, during your deliberations, if you think unconscious bias has shaped your evaluation, I encourage you to think about the evidence again with this video in mind and to discuss it with your fellow jurors. The value of self-awareness and willingness to examine implicit bias is illustrated by a letter we received from a juror. She wrote that after contentious deliberations leading to an impasse, she and her fellow jurors paused and let each person speak. They found that each had unconsciously brought personal biases to the deliberations. Little at a time, they examined how their biases influence their views. As that juror put it, I found I was bringing prior knowledge to my decision and finally had to admit to my fellow jurors that what I thought I knew was not heard as evidence and should not be taken into consideration. Four others revealed personal biases that had to be shed. Having exposed their biases, they then made real progress in their deliberations. The, the trial that I served on uh, showed me and taught me that um, you can get 12 individuals together from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, and you can all come together and make a unanimous decision. And we didn't have one decision to make. We had 50 or so decisions to make on my particular trial. Um, so it took a while to go through our whole process. Um, it's reassuring knowing that's the system we have. Should you be chosen to serve on a jury, I am confident you will find it to be a challenging, stimulating, and most of all, worthwhile experience. Many jurors feel a sense of pride at having fulfilled this vitally important civic duty. Once again, Thank you for being here and for giving us your attention. I felt that it was more than just a duty to sit in that chair and just say, would I give my verdict? It was literally a way for me to be able to pay back society for what I would want them to do for me one day. It was great actually seeing that, okay, this is what, this is a fair process. Now I see what it's all about. And yes, I do want to be a part of this. I wanted to serve and I was very excited because I felt it was an honor to be picked and to be able to help my country. It's the only way we know to make sure that people are treated fairly is to hear the evidence against them and have impartial people evaluate that process. It's what our country is built on. Um, and again, if I were in that position, I would want a jury of my peers deciding my fate. Not just one person, um, but a jury of my peers. Our jury trial system makes our American citizens more of stakeholders in what happens in our country, more so than in other countries. It's one of the reasons I think we should really treasure our trial jury system.